Let's bow our heads and look to God in prayer. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for sending our Lord, our Savior, our Master Jesus into this world. We thank you that he lived a perfect sinless life as an example to us. We thank you that he died in our place and that he rose from the grave. And we thank you that he sits at your right hand. We thank you, O Lord Jesus, for your promise to come back again. Lord, we know, dear God, that there are many great things that happen in this world, in our histories. But Lord, we recognize that one of the greatest things that ever happened in this world was when you came when you divided history. Lord, we recognize that the next big thing to come into this, to our world, will be when you return. And so, Lord, we ask and pray that you would help us to live in recognition of that truth of your coming. Master, we, we thank you for the privilege that we have to sing these beautiful songs that remind us of your life, of your death. Thank you again, O Lord, for reminding us of how important your return is. So I ask and pray for each one of us over here, dear God, that you'd help us to focus, to live our lives in eager expectancy of your return. Lord, I'm going to thank you for each head that is bowed down over here this morning. Thank you that you are our God. Thank you for all that you are doing in our lives. Thank you for your grace, your mercy, your love that each one of us has experienced. And thank you for the opportunities that you give us to share this with others. Thank you again, O oh Lord, for the privilege to share the gospel, the good news about Jesus with those little children who are here this past week. We pray and commit them to your care, O oh Lord. We pray that the seeds of the gospel that are sowed in their heart, that they would, Lord, that they would take root and bear fruit one day in your time. Lord, we pray for the, the families, that you'd bless them. And Lord, that these families would have you as, as the head. We pray and ask you, dear Lord, that your promises would be worked out for them. Lord, we pray as a church that, Master, you would continue to be our head and that your plans and purposes would be fulfilled in this church. We pray, O oh God, and commit those, Lord, amongst us who may be struggling with different kinds of illnesses and sicknesses, problems in life, relationships. We ask and pray, O oh Lord, Master, that you would reveal your power, your, your, your presence and your peace in our lives, O oh God. Lord, we pray that you teach us and help us to live as your disciples, witnessing about you and living out the truth of your word in our lives each moment of every day. Father, we pray and commit our nation into your hands. We thank you again, O oh Lord, for, Lord, that we can celebrate Independence Day this week. We pray, Heavenly Father, Master, for, uh, for all those who, who fought for this independence, O oh Lord. And we pray for the, Lord, uh, Lord, for all that they fought for. We pray again, O oh Master, Lord, that those would those would be become important again for this nation, that you would become first again in this nation, that your word would find place in our hearts, in homes, in churches, in schools. We pray and ask you, Heavenly Lord, that your will would be worked out for this nation. Dear God, we pray and ask you, Heavenly Master, that you'd bless the leaders of this nation, 
We pray that they would, they would govern justly and rightly, O oh God. So guide them, O oh Master. We pray and ask you, Heavenly Father, for the churches all over this world, Father, that you'd bless the ministry of your word, even as your word goes out in different churches today. We pray that you'd bless your word, that you would use your word, O Master, to convict, to challenge, to correct, and to consecrate your people into a right relationship with you, into a ministry for you. We pray for us, O God, that even as we look into your word now, that you would speak to us. Lord, we pray that you would find us willing, that you would find us willing, O Master, to listen to you and obedient, O Lord, to accept your word. So, Lord, we, we commit ourselves to you. Work in us. Bless us. For we ask this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Last Tuesday, Paul Mumo was very kind to drive me to Philadelphia to get my father-in-law from the airport. And while we, were driving, while we were driving over there, Paul mentioned that a few years back in, you know, in a conversation that he was having with some of his friends, they were discussing about keeping God's law keeping God's law. And then that conversation turned to the keeping of the law of the land, the keeping of the speed limits on the road. And, uh, you know, what he said is, you know, that if we do not keep the speed limit that's there on the road, the written speed limit, we are essentially breaking the law. And, you know, in that conversation, Paul was very convicted and since then, Paul has tried to keep that speed limit when he's driving. And Paul said, uh, you know, that keeps his wife happy, so Barbara is happy. And uh, Paul also doesn't need to worry about the cops. And he doesn't need to worry about the speeding tickets. Right? That's very good advice coming from an older, experienced Christian driver to a younger one. And I was so glad that I'm dark-skinned because, you know, Paul couldn't see me going red in the face, you know, when, when he was talking about this. Uh, but here's the thing. When Paul shared about keeping that speed limit, we were going at 70 miles per hour on the turnpike, okay? But in a few minutes, as we were, as we were traveling towards Philadelphia on the turnpike, we noticed how the digital speed you know, limit boards on the road, they changed to 60, and then a little ahead to 50, and then a little ahead to 45, and then even 35. This is on the turnpike, okay? And, and, there, were, and there were cars zipping you know, past us on the other lane. And I turned to Paul and I said, well, Looks like someone is testing you to see whether you will still keep the speed limit as you had decided as a Christian. Someone is testing you. Does it ever seem to you that you have had more trouble after becoming a Christian than you did before? Does it does it ever seem to you that you've had a you know, little more trouble after becoming a Christian than you did before? Well, that is because a true Christian believer who is constantly led by the Holy Spirit can be sure to be in a spiritual war, a spiritual battle every moment of every day with our three enemies, the world, the flesh, and the worst one, the devil. That's what Ephesians 2, 1 to 3 tells us. And Wearsby, you know, puts this very beautifully. He says, he writes, Sooner or later, every believer discovers that the Christian life is a battleground, not a playground. 
and that he faces an enemy who is much stronger than he is apart from the Lord. Now, two Sundays back, we had looked at the stages of growth in our Christian life. You remember that? From little children, we grow to become young men, and then we grow to become fathers. We saw that in 1 John, right? And last Sunday, we learned that we can easily recognize this spiritual growth or we can easily recognize spiritual decay in our own lives and in the lives of other people. How? Very simple. We just look at the fruit of one's life, the fruit that one's life produces. All that we need to do is look at the fruit. We will recognize them by their fruit. We can know how much spiritual growth they've had or how much spiritual decay. And then we focused on growing in the fruit of Christian love. Now, remember, I told you, uh, you know, last Sunday, the pastor who can make your tummy disappear? Everyone remembers that, right? Well, if you want to lose some spiritual flab, one very good Christian diet, one very good Christian exercise is to pursue Christian love as it is given in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Very good diet, very good exercise. Pursue Christian love as given in 1 Corinthians 13. Now, today we look at the Christian's strength and outfit. You know, a Christ, you know, you know when, when we go to do a certain work, we wear a certain outfit, right? I mean, if you, if you go to swim, you wear a certain outfit. When you go to, um, you know, do certain kinds of work, you wear an outfit, right? Or maybe a uniform, right, which is suitable for that occasion. And a Christian also has an outfit. We read about this in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 18. And by the way, this was also the theme of the church VBS. This was the theme of the VBS also, Ephesians 6, uh, you know, 10 to 18. So let's, let's read what Paul has to tell us from that. Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that ye may be able, you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. This is the word of the Lord. So, Paul, you know, he begins over here in verse 10. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. My dear brothers and sisters, our strength for this battle is not in ourselves. It is in Jesus Christ. You remember, we, we had seen this, you know, some time back. We divided that word Christian, right? Christ and I-A-N. In Christ, we are made new. 
But without Christ, we are nothing. So even in the Christian battleground, let us not trust in our own strength. With our power, nothing is accomplished. And we will lose very quickly in this battleground if we are trusting in our own wisdom and our own strength. We can only be victorious in Christ. That's why Paul writes, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. And in order to be strong in the Lord, the Christian must put on the whole armor of God. We cannot miss even one piece. Why? Why can't we... I mean, why do we need to put on this, this armor? What's the purpose of putting on this armor of God? Paul talks about in, in verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Now, uh, notice that Paul also repeats the same thing in verse 13. The same thing as verse 11. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Now, it is our responsibility as believers to put on the full armor of God. It's our responsibility. And what's the purpose, again, of, of putting on the full armor of God? That we can stand against the schemes of the devil. Now, um, as I read through this passage, I don't know how many of you noticed that even though this passage talks about Christian warfare, it talks about us wearing an armor. Paul doesn't talk about attacking the devil. Paul uses the word stand. He doesn't use the word attack, but he uses the word stand four times over here. I, I hope you can see that. You know, if you read verse 11, it's there, stand against the schemes of the, of the devil. Then, you know, in 13, withstand. You may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. And then verse 14, stand therefore. Four times, stand. Now, think about it. What good is standing when we are in a battle? What good is standing when we are in a battle? Have you ever played a game... You know, when, you know, in the game when you have to fight the enemy and, uh, you know, or probably you have to jump over some obstacles that are coming against you. Ever played that game? What happens if you just stand over there and the obstacles are just coming at you and you're not doing nothing and you're not doing anything? What happens? Well, it's game over. You, I mean, that character in, in that game dies, Right? So what good is standing? What good is standing in the fight? Well, you see, here's the difference. In every game that we play, we are playing or we are fighting to win. To win. Isn't it? Even in the game of chess that we had over here, the tournament, it was to win. We played to win. But in Christian warfare, Christian warfare is not to win. It's not for victory. Our Christian warfare is from victory. Jesus has already won the victory by his death and resurrection. In our Christian warfare, we stand and we hold on to all that God gives us in Jesus Christ and we do not let any of it to be lost or be taken away from us. It's not us advancing against the devil and winning and conquering some new territory from the devil. No. Jesus has already done that. We are called to stand and to defend what is ours in Jesus Christ. Verse 12 gives us some insight into the enemy that we are battling against. Uh, verse 12, For we do not wrestle against 
flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. What this is telling us is that Satan's demons are very, very well organized. Rulers, authorities, cosmic powers of this dark world, spiritual forces, it's, it's all very well organized. And, you know, if you read uh, Daniel chapter 10, if you read Jude 9, you'll get a glimpse of these spiritual enemies fighting. Let us be aware, my dear brothers and sisters, of our enemies and the evil schemes of the devil. We need to be aware of this. But don't get scared. But be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God and stand. Because that's what God asks us to do, to stand. Don't do anything more. Don't do anything less. Stand. See, Satan... Satan is not all-powerful. Satan is not all-knowing. Satan is not ever-present. Satan is not sovereign. But who is? Who is all-powerful? Who is all-knowing? Who is ever-present? Who is sovereign? Our God is. So trust Him. Therefore, verse 13, take up your whole arm, the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. When is the evil day? Well, any day that we are tempted. Right? That's, the, that's, that's that day. And we need this armor of God to stand. Now, remember Paul is you know, writing this, this epistle. He's writing this letter when he's locked up in prison. Uh, Paul is chained to a Roman guard. And these Roman guards used to be always dressed in their armor. And maybe that's why Paul is writing, as he looks at this Roman guard in his armor, he thinks about you know, the Christian's armor. But, remember this, Paul is locked up in that prison but I'm sure that he felt the presence of Jesus with him. And probably the Holy Spirit reminded Paul of you know, the Old Testament, of Jesus the Messiah in the Old Testament. And you know the same thing that Paul talks about in the New Testament about the armor of God is, is given in the Old Testament, especially in, in Isaiah, Isaiah 11.5. Righteousness, this is about the Messiah, the Messiah. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. Isaiah 59, 17. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. Isaiah 52, 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. And Isaiah 49, 2. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me away. Prophet Isaiah is describing the Messiah, our Lord Jesus Christ, with this armor as the warrior king of God. And probably this is what you know, Paul saw as he's sitting chained to you know, that, that, Roman, that Roman guard, that Roman soldier. And the other thing is that this whole armor, the whole armor that Paul will talk about now, that we look at, it's, it's, the whole armor is a picture of Jesus. The belt of truth, that is Jesus, because Jesus is the truth. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
the breastplate of righteousness, that's Jesus, because He is our righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.21 God made Him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. The shoes of peace, that's Jesus. Ephesians 2.14 it tells us, for he himself is our peace. The shield of faith, that's only because of Jesus. As Paul writes in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified for Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The helmet of salvation, that's Jesus. You remember when, you know, Mary and Joseph, um, you know, when they took baby Jesus into the temple, old Simeon, he took baby Jesus in his arms and he praised God in Luke chapter 2 verse 30 and he said, for my eyes have seen your salvation. That's Jesus, the helmet of salvation. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. That's also Jesus. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And, you know, John 1.14, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So you see, this whole armor, this whole armor is basically Jesus. So, in our text... Let's read about this armor. Verse 14. Stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now Paul describes the items that the Roman soldier wore in order in which he would have to put them on. Okay? Before a Roman soldier, before he put on the armor, he would put a belt round his waist to tuck in his, you know, in his loose and long robes so that, they, you know, he wouldn't trip over those robes. This belt would hold both the breastplate and the scabbard for the sword in place. So it was a very important piece of equipment. The, uh, you know, the belt, the belt around his waist. And uh, Paul, you know, when, when he's talking about this, um, about the belt of truth, to stand against Satan, we need to, re we need to re uh, rely on God's revealed truth. On God's revealed truth. And we also need to put it into practice. Truth as a lifestyle, it should become a lifestyle. We, you know, truth should become a lifestyle. We, we do not only tell the truth when it doesn't upset people. But we have to be truthful. Don't only be truthful when it is convenient. And don't even think about half-truths. This is the belt of truth. Paul writes in verse 14, Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, the breastplate, it covered the soldier's body, from the neck to the thighs, to the thighs in front and the back, and so it protected the vital organs of the body. So, the breastplate of righteousness, what is this righteousness? Is it our righteousness because of the good things that we do? Is, is that, you know, what we are putting on? No, Isaiah 64, 6, it says, Our righteousness is like filthy rags. This breastplate of righteousness is the righteousness of Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Again, He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. That's the breastplate of righteousness. So we need to live 
depending on the righteousness of Christ and walk in that righteousness in our daily lives so to be protected against Satan. Verse 15. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. This is not about spreading the gospel. We have to wear the armor and we have to stand. Right? That's what, that's what we saw. Now, Roman soldiers, they, it seems, wore very tough sandals that were studded with sharp, thick nails on the bottom to sort of increase the traction. So, this, uh, the shoes of your, for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace, what Paul is talking about over here, the gospel of peace which enables us to stand firm. We can stand firm knowing that we have Jesus' peace. Now, the Bible talks about two qualities of peace. There is a peace with God and there is a peace of God. Peace with God. We have peace with God, you know, because Jesus has died in our place, paying the penalty for our sins. But there is also the peace of God. If you read Philippians chapter 4 verse 7, it says, And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God means that we experience His peace, even in the midst of the most trying circumstances. This is what we need to protect us against, you know, the wiles of the enemy. Verse 16. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. You know, the kind of shield that is spoken about over here, it's basically a very large shield. You know, some people say it's about uh, two and a half feet wide and about four and a half feet high. And it's made of solid wood and it's covered by metal or leather. And often soldiers would stand side by side with their shields together, forming a long protective wall against, you know, the enemy arrows that would come. Our shield is a shield of faith. This faith is basically a simple trust in God. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4, it says, The righteous will live by faith. The righteous will live by faith. And this is repeated three times in the New Testament. Romans 1, 17, Galatians 3, 11, Hebrews 10, 38. The righteous will live by faith. It's a simple faith. Simple faith, trusting in God. It is by faith that we enter the Christian life. It is by faith that we receive salvation and continued blessings from God. All faith in Jesus. Now, the shield that you know, Paul is talking about, this, this shield, is, it must be taken up, it must be deliberately taken up. We must intentionally stand by what we believe. If we truly live, if we truly believe God and we live in obedience to Him, then the flaming arrows of the evil one will be extinguished. And we have a lot, a lot of flaming arrows that will constantly be coming against us by the evil one. Doubt, discouragement, destruction, you know, doing wrong, division, and more. And it is the shield, it is this shield of faith. It will protect us against these flaming arrows of the evil one. Verse 17, take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now, the helmet and the sword are the last two pieces that the, that the soldier takes up as he dresses in his armor. These are the last two pieces that he takes up. Woolward and Zook, they write, they write this. They write, Having one's head 
guarded by a helmet gives a sense of safety. So the helmet of salvation refers to either present safety from the devil's attack or a future deliverance. You remember what 1 Thessalonians 5.8, Paul writes over there, but since we belong to the day, let us, not be, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. Satan, he loves to see us living in discouragement and doubt. Satan points to all our failures and our faults and anything else which seems negative. That is what Satan does. Satan wants us to doubt our salvation. He wants us to doubt God's goodness. He wants us to doubt God's word. The helmet of salvation, it gives us confidence that we need to face the enemy. It gives us confidence and hope that we are children of God. The sword of the Spirit. Now, the sword... Uh, carried by the Roman soldiers, what, what was basically short and two-edged. And soldiers, they used it, it seems, to thrust and to cut in hand-to-hand -hand combat. In Paul's description, the sword is the only offensive weapon, the sword, right? Our sword is of the spirit. It is a spiritual sword. And it can be used to defend ourselves against the blows of the enemy and to strike a blow ourselves. The sword of the Spirit is the Bible, the Word of God. Hebrews 4.12, it describes this scripture in this way. For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. The Word of God is a spiritual weapon and we must learn to use it effectively. We must learn to use it effectively against our enemy. But here's the thing, my dear brothers and sisters, you know, it looks so wonderful, right, having that, that sword in the hand of a warrior dressed for battle. But here's the thing, what, you, what we believe about this Bible, the inerrancy, the infallibility of the scriptures, do, do we truly believe that this is completely the word of God? Or do we believe that, you know, portions of it may be the word of God? Maybe some of it, oh, we don't know, maybe, right? Some of the miracles, ah, who knows, right? If, if we believe, if we pick and choose that way, you know what happens to this sword? We, we end up holding a tiny butter knife against our enemy, the devil. This is the sword of the spirit. This is the sword of the spirit. But what we believe about this, you know, we either end up holding a sword or a tiny butter knife against the enemy. And it's the same with all the other parts of this armor too. Do we truly believe? Do we truly believe our salvation? Or do we doubt it? You see how weak, how weak we make this, you know, this armor itself that God has given us. But here is what we find, here is where we find the Christian's armor. It's all about our relationship with Christ. Each piece of armor stems from knowing Christ more and more as we put on Christ and as we live in Christ. See, we have the armor of God, but it will do us no good unless we are always living in a relationship with God and we are receiving strength and power from Him. The armor God gives us it cannot be used unless we are living in an everyday fellowship and communion with God. And that's why that last verse, verse 18, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with perseverance, making supplication for all 
the saints. This is what we need. And by the way, Paul is not just addressing individual Christians, but he, he is addressing the whole church corporately as an army, not singular saints. You remember lone soldiers. It's very easy for the enemy to pick off lone soldiers. And so, my dear brothers and sisters, we all need to put on this whole armor of God and we all need to stand together. It seems there were a bunch of recruits who were having a written examination. And when one of them was asked why, you know, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't writing, you know, he wasn't giving in that exam, that written examination, the recruit said, Sir, I have neither paper nor pencil. Well, said the instructor, what would you think of a soldier who went into battle with neither rifle nor ammunition? The recruit th thought for a moment and then he answered, I think he'd be an officer, sir. Unfortunately, too many Christians today think that we are officers in God's army and we have no need of these spiritual weapons that God gives us. My dear brothers and sisters, take up the whole armor of God that you'll be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. To stand firm. Let's close our eyes. Let's bow down our heads. Gracious God, we thank you that you've not just given us new life. You've not just helped us to recognize the enemy and his evil schemes. But you've also given us the armor of God. So that in this battleground, we may be able to stand. We may fight from the victory of our Lord Jesus Christ that he has won for us. And so may dear God, I, I just pray and come at each one of us who are into your hands. I pray that you would give us insight into this armor. And that each one of us would be dressed ready every day for battle against the evil one. Let it not be one, but let it be each one of us. And may we be able to encourage and help each other in this battle. We thank you again, O Lord, for listening to us. In Jesus' most precious name we ask and we pray. Amen. Receive the benediction in faith. And now may the grace, mercy, and peace of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit Rest, remain, and abide with each one of us, both now and forevermore. Amen. God bless each and every one of you. Have a wonderful week. Thank you.